right? Okay, well welcome. Good to have you guys here. No Bully, just a little bit about No Bully and myself before we launch into the night. So No Bully's been around for about a dozen plus years and it's a nonprofit based in San Francisco. And you can see from what it says up there, you know, mission really is about bullying. And we work with hundreds of schools throughout the nation from East Coast to West Coast and everywhere in between focused on, on bullying prevention and working literally with the teachers, with the staff to do that and there's a, a set way that we work with them. But No Bully also has a global presence and is now known globally in terms of its influence for eradicating bullying. So that's a little bit about No Bully. I've been working in education for many decades in a variety of capacities from working as young as preschool age children and as old as uni for teaching university classes. So I've been everything in between. I had been a uh, principal and a superintendent at an elementary school. I ran a program for new teachers at my county for many years. And now I've been working, I think this is my sixth year working with No Bully. So I do facilitate workshops and trainings and I also develop materials for them. So I do some writing and curriculum and material development. So for tonight, we're gonna break it into three parts. The first part is the what. So we're looking at the digital landscape in our digital world, what is it? The second part is the, the so what. So now I understand what it is. In relation, we're talking about in relation to the zero to eight ages, not just the whole thing, but in terms of young children. So now the so what is how do I navigate this? And then the last part is the now what? So what resources do I have? And how can I move forward in a way that's gonna be, I can work effectively with my child and, and actually do navigate in a way that works. So before we go into part one, just you know, thumbs up, thumbs down in terms of if you agree or disagree with this statement. In general, less time my child spends with the screen, the better that off they are. And I'm thinking about the young children. So thumbs up, thumbs down. So when this was a survey question that Common Sense Media asked parents, and when they were asked this question, 79% of parents either strongly agreed or agreed with the statement. So the majority of parents, obviously much higher than the majority, agreed with the statement. I love that photo. Actually, I love that photo and I hate that photo at the same time. <laughs> So the what, here we are in the what. So when you think about all the influential factors for your child, as a young, you know, your child is, is born into the world, there are so many different people, places, factors that influence your child. And, you know, just to think about one special influencing person and factor in your child's life, somebody that is there from the onset and something that's, uh, that, that's there from the onset is pretty constant is actually helps your child learn about the world, helps your child navigate making friends and building those friendships, helps your child when they go to school with homework, helps your child kind of you know, change classes, schools, kind of helps your child with, with everything in terms of those kinds of transitions and even helps when they enter the adult world. It's pretty much a constant in your child's life and your child would spend more time with than anybody. Any guesses of, of who, what that is? Say that again, teacher? Any other? Guesses of who or what? The peer parents. So parents are, yeah, parents, friends, family. Think about it, yeah, yeah. So think about it in terms of like the very young child, absolutely your parents, you know. But it's really, I, I'm talking about like a little device and, and the digital world. Because when that child gets old enough, that is gonna be the constant. Look at kids now. That's gonna be the constant. What's the constant in their world? Who do kids spend more time with? You know, as opposed to, so it's, it's the, it is that one, you could almost be guaranteed your child is gonna have a one-to-one -one relationship with some kind of digital device. And what age that begins, how much time they spend on it, how long they have, that, that's all variables that differ. 
but they almost guarantee that they're gonna have a one-to-one -one relationship, yes. And when you look at teenagers, how many teenagers spend eight hours a day with their parents? I, very, very, very rare for that to happen. How many might spend eight hours on their digital device? Very common. So that's, the, that's one of the influential factors. And it's challenging. So we're, we'll start to unravel this challenge. And I do want to say something about the color of this. The, my Mac and this projector up here, you know, the, the color is the oddest thing. So the background is really not that color. So the white, what usually is easy to read, is a little odd. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So what you see here is that kids are online from the earliest years. I mean, you see, I mean, what you see in this picture, you, I mean, you see this all the time. With somebody, the kid's in your lap, and you know, they're looking at what you have in your lap. So what happens, though, for what we do know is that the billion of, you know, the one billion kids that we have, which young child, the definition is really like eight and under, so zero to eight. That's your, your young child definition. And they really are growing up in this world very different than what we grew up in. We did not have, we had TVs. We didn't have this kind of technology influence. Constant, not to mention constant. So think about all the skills that you were taught. I think about the skills that my parents instilled in me as a child. They were, they're foundational to who I am as an adult. And I know that. And I know that they taught me those skills as a young child over time. And they're life skills. And you do it naturally, and you do it intentionally with your own kids. You're definitely doing it. However, what you have to do is say, we got to do that with this online world, too. Because kids need a compass. And it isn't, you know, you just can't hand them a set of directions. You know, they need that internal, and it's not just a moral compass, but it's a compass to help them navigate. So that's part of what we need to be doing as adults. Common Sense Media is where a lot of the research comes from. It's an organization that has really works relentlessly and does a lot of research relative to media and technology. So much of what you'll see tonight comes out of Common Sense Media, and they are in your resources. So they did a, 2011, they did this study, and they then repeated it in 2017. And so from, in that period of time, what they found is that ages zero to eight use the screen media, average two hours, 19 minutes each day. And when you break it down, it breaks down by under age two, 42 minutes. It's pretty startling. Ages two to four, two hours and 40 minutes. Five to eight, about three hours. Third of it is mobile. That's a big change, actually. That went from 4% to 35% in the six-year period of time in these two, in the studies. And now, just like, you know, TV became ubiquitous in our, our households, the same thing is true in terms of mobile devices. There's rarely a home that doesn't have, a, talk about a mobile device, <laughs> usually multiple multi, mo mobile devices in the home. So just to think about your own kids, what, what have you seen in terms of, what have you noticed over time? These are just some examples of what came out of the study. What kinds of things have you noticed? You know, when they come home and visit our, our sons in college now, and he's got his phone with them all the time. I mean, it's just, he, he's never separated from it, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, it, it's, you know, he's, he's a good kid, and he's been, you know, he's working hard and being successful, and, but that, he, there's very little separation between his phone. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's constantly, like, even when we're sitting, talking, he's constantly in conversation with his friends mm -hmm. through a bunch of different, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, you know. So I mean, I feel like he's present, but he's he's also multitasking. Yeah. With, you know, mm -hmm. with Distracted. Yeah. 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 But I think you know, in fairness, we all do that too, to a certain extent. Yeah. We all model that because it's hard, you know. And yeah. I, 
I, I'm the first one to, to have to in, be intentional about disconnecting, yeah. you know, because it is so intentional. And my kids like three, and they're um, in their 20s and then 30. And, they, you know, I think the older they get, they're almost a better inspiration for me because they're learning that mentally it's kind of wrecking uh -huh. havoc because their work life is continuing and continuing and they need to sort of decompress. And so, yeah, so I see them um, trying, to, trying to create boundaries around it, right? mm -hmm. which is interesting. It's not something I think in the past, obviously, we had to struggle with. That wasn't right. something we had, yeah. Right, right. But they're recognizing that. Now they're recognizing it. It's a process. Mm -hmm. Maybe when they were in college, not so much then, but now that they are all working, right. and I think they're realizing for their own mental health that they right. have to, yeah. Right. And Russ, you said you had seven and ten year old? Yeah. So do you see like a like in the last three years with the, the difference between Yeah, we definitely get more more yeah. much more obsessed, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we had a rule that, you know, it was pretty much just weekends and now I think we're getting a little lax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a question actually. When you, when you say use of the screen media is not including, um, it's not including TV, right? No, that is not including TV. No, what right. about use of the screen media academic? Because I work, I, my children are late to end early, but I work in the school, elementary school right. in Tobago, and they, uh, they use it for, for programs right. and, and also for homework. Right, right, right. Or a fifth grade is a book and they take it home everything. So they are there. It's not just media. It's, it's not, not just media. Exactly. Yeah. Kids, kids are, are no, yes. it's academic. Academic. Is yes. that what you are you? Yes. Yes, there are kids that, yes, it includes more use in terms of school use. So that their use of, their use of a, even a computer or a phone for school has also risen pretty dramatically. Yeah. And that's the older kids, not the zero to eight so much. That's not, that's not true for the zero to eight. There we go. All right, so this just gives you that visual in terms of the five minutes all the way up to the 48 minutes. So that's a, that's a pretty, and again, that's mobile, mobile media use. So that's the difference in mobile media. Now, the cell phones were not as ubiquitous in 2011 as they are today. So, of course, this goes with the times, but, you know, we're still talking about the zero to eight-year-old. And then, again, that four to 35 percent, that, again, is the screen time being mobile versus TV, DVDs, games, video games, that kind of thing. That's the white color in that circle. So that's just the visual for you. Another organization, in addition to Common Sense Media, is called Zero to Three. So now we're talking, you know, newborn babies, toddlers. And they also did this report called Screen Sense. Because again, this is <laughs> front and center with people with babies and toddlers, and what do I, you know, what do I do with these kids? So they were looking at what is the impact. And just like Common Sense Media, Zero to Three has a tremendous amount of support for parents and educators. and, and resources for you relative to thinking about what do I do with screens in my child. What is different, which we all recognize, is the fact that babies born today, they are, all these kids born today are truly digital natives. I mean, that, that, that term fits for a reason, and it's because they are born into this digital world, and it surrounds them. I, I mean, think about how much it surrounds all of us every day in many different ways and settings. So that, that kind of, it's, I don't think it's always so seamless in terms of, but our human world and our digital world is always there. Like you talked about your son being sitting with him and he, but he's always got it there. So you have that human connection, but that digital is right there with him as well. And they did this report and they said, okay, the most important thing to think about is uh, what they call the three C's. And that's really about your individual child. Every kid is different, so you can't necessarily think about what somebody else is doing with their two or three-year-old or five-year-old and what you're doing. 
So individual child, the context, so how, what, what kind of context are you using the media, and then the content of the exposure. So what, what, what is the actual content? So this is just broken down a little bit more in saying that, is this, is this right for my child right now? You know that, and you look, might look back and say, no, no, I don't think so. I, my child does not need this right now. And then the content is, is it meaningful? Is it something that relates to the child's real world? Is it too esoteric for some kids? You know, some, we, we'd look at something and think it would be great for this kid to, to see or to learn about. Yeah, well, maybe, but maybe not at three, or maybe not at five. It might be better at seven. And then the context is a lot of times kids are doing this stuff passively, especially the younger kids. So they're just, they're, they're just watching something. They're not interacting. So the, what you see, you can't quite read it too well, but it's choosing media that you don't mind experiencing right along a side with your child. So that it isn't just a young child watching something, but you're actually doing it together. It's interactive, not just between the two of you, but with the screen as well. So it takes away that passive kind of sitting. The other thing that, that came out of the Screen Sense report is kind of what you see these kids doing. These kids are using their hands. They are in the 3D world. They're in the real world. They're digging. They actually get their hands in the dirt. So that is saying, OK, they need to be out there, and they need to be playing in a world that is not a screen, you know, that to separate them away from that. And then you have to be careful about your expectations. So going back to what you were saying about you know, exposure, educational, that absolutely there's a lot of great educational things in terms of screen, but you know, you've got to be careful about what your expectations are for those because you, they can't just, their learning has got to come from their experiences, not from their passively watching something. And that actually relates to what's called transfer of learning. So like these kids go and they're, they're planting. So they're helping your, they're in their garden with you and they're learning to plant something and they got all the seeds and they're doing that and they're digging and they're covering the dirt. Well, then they go in the house and three days later, you see them taking some beans and you know they're putting them in cups and they do they have transferred that hands-on experiential learning that they are now bringing into their play world but that's it, it shows the transfer of learning well what they found is that if it's a screen there's a transfer deficit they don't necessarily transfer the learning from the screen even though you think they've got it they, three days later, or you know, 24 hours later, or five weeks later, they're not necessarily going to transfer that. So that's the other problem with screens and learning and our expectations that it's educational, so they'll get something from it. Maybe not. So it's got to be, if they're going to have some media exposure, then it should really, the four pillars are, is, are they active? Is it meaningful? Does it have a social component, and are they engaged? That's what you really need to look for. And, and that, again, this is young children, but you know, as kids get older, you definitely want to see some of these as well. So this is just a one-minute video. This comes out of the University of Calgary, and they did a study with over 2,500 kids and mothers where they were looking at developmental measures and screen time. And they, were, they asked questions over a period of time in the kids' development.
The one thing that you saw there in terms of the expressive language, you know, that was where they really saw the, the delay in terms of, you know, the kids, the kids in terms of their communication with nonverbal or their, their kind of social interaction was okay, but the expressive language not so much. And again, that's the young kids, so that's just the kids entering the world. So just 10 minutes, you know, that we were going to do this in groups if this was a bigger group, but you're it. <laughs> so this is just, what's the, that's part one. So that was part one in terms of the, the what. So that's, it, you know, you could go back and take a look at what's in your handout, the video you just watched. What either stood out for you, what did you learn? or possibly think more deeply about in relation to media and screens for your child that might influence you as a parent raising a child today or even no matter how old your children are. You know, what, what, what stood out for you? You guys could actually, we could just do this as a, yeah. as a group. <laughs> so, I, mean, I, I mean, to me, if I was a parent now of a, you know, young child, I feel like, given what I'm seeing here, I would want to delay their device screen time as long as possible. I would just want to keep it separate in a way, you know, as long as I could. And that's, that's why, you know, and I, I don't know if, if it, you know, it would, you know, it would take me changing my practice, you know, just having my phone. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we're a bad influence. I mean, you yeah. set the tone, you know, yeah. like you said. Yeah. Well, it's hard. You can't take it away if you're not going to take it away from, yeah. from yourself. Right. Right. Teach by example. Right. 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 I would not wait until we just get it out there. At least it won't be last time they got to know. Yeah. I love it. It's a pandemic. Yeah. But it's still a screen. I would wait until. It seems like it. It seems like it. It seems like it. It's like, yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know they talk there or something. Babies, they can't even walk, and they will really die. Yeah. Yeah, they're watching, they're watching. They're watching. Yeah. And it's, it, it's startling to see very young kids be able to swipe and do something. Yeah. 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 I mean, they say the best babysitting, babysitter. Yeah. 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 And parents use it as a babysitter. Yeah. Yeah. Just like they did when my kids were growing up, I felt like ungrateful, almost that. I mean, they did have the, obviously, the phones got introduced and that was a whole dilemma in itself. And the sooner you introduce that, I think the sooner they start to become more connected too, even if it's for a great reason of obviously wanting to connect with the kids and making sure they're safe and get a hold of them, right? But I always felt like when they were growing up, we limited TV time. Like that was just like, we always had this rule. So I always felt like anything looking up at something was sort of to me out. But then again, I didn't have all the social media and yeah. attraction right now. Like this would be super, this is a totally different element. Like it's ramped up like you wouldn't believe in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But, um, so yeah, it doesn't surprise me that it delays the onset of development. Right. At the same time, I can see the constant struggle, because it is, it's a constant struggle. So are you saying that, um, so we'll have the sitters come over, the kids and we'll have something on Netflix, a kid show? Are you saying that's not as, um, Damaging, or I don't know what the right word is, but uh, that type of media is maybe not as. So, like watching a movie. Right, watching right. a movie that's 10 feet away versus right. a screen. Right. Well, you know, I think it's. It depends on how you're looking at it. I mean, you've got the whole safety of screens that has to do with radio frequency. You know, then you have TV, like you were saying, you know, that was, that's, that's passive. But, you know, you've got a babysitter coming on over, and they're going to be there a couple hours. A movie, you know, there's, there's, again, the screens are a reality. It's a matter of how how you pick and choose. Good choice to, if you're gonna, they're going to be on screens, I might prefer them as a group. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're watching a bigger screen that's further away. Yes. yes. It's something you pick, but they're all watching. All yeah, it's watching. probably, it's like, it seems like it's less enticing and interactive. Like, you, if you, if you give a young person a screen, now they're interacting with it and they're controlling yeah. it. Where it, you know you're sitting and watching it. Sure, right. it seems like it. You know, yeah, it's so we don't, draw we don't let the little guy do games while there's a sitter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. And you're interacting. You know what I'm saying? Like you're all watching together. I mean, yeah. I always right. felt like family movie night. I mean, those right. were good things. So right. Those weren't you know, right. Or even when we got a sitter, yeah, we would have we would pick a movie for them yeah. to watch. Yeah. yeah.
Well, and you'd be able to talk about the movie, and yeah. you know, you'd have a discussion about it, and right. yeah, right. yeah. So that's a practical question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, at, by the end of this, you know, you'll just start thinking about what is it that I'm doing, yeah. what is it that's working, yeah. and you know, what might I consider doing differently. You know, I see my son being more screen addicted, wanting to look at a pad while the TV's on, which, oh, yeah. which I wouldn't want to yeah. encourage. You yeah. say that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. That is. That's right. Some kids like triple. <laughs> they like to have the TV on, the iPad here, the phone here, <laughs> just like it, and doing homework over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a whole lot. Yeah, we um, have our kids doing additional school beyond their regular school, a program called Kuma. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So that's their reward is screen time if they do their Kuma. Ah, okay. <laughs> right, right, but they get some. <laughs> Right. Mm hmm Okay, any did you want to add anything or um, I just think it's it come with times and the kids have access to the school, at home, it's just things are changing. Yeah. But we just have to supervise them. Yeah. Yes. I know when my kids will little computer will come in I went to a few workshops. <laughs> at that time with the PC. Right. And they say, put it in a in a part of the house that you can yeah, you can be checking. You can. But right now, it's it's different because it's little things. Oh, I know. Okay. Right? Open your purse. What does it? What you got? Yeah. It's just it's getting harder and harder, and they can also hide things. Mm -hmm. You know how to. Right. Uh, I think parents have to. To be vigilant. Yeah. Be the. Yes. What they're doing. You know, what are, yeah. what are yeah. they going into? I forgot that though. We did. We had our computer in the family room. The kids yeah. did their homework. I had it and, in the kitchen. And, yeah, and, and the kitchen, uh, the family room went into the kitchen. So as I was cooking, I could see it was like in this area ah, that they were doing. Right. And that was the only. Oh, that's good. Thing. But it was a big screen. You can see it. But that's true. Yeah. It is a Well, well <laughs> yeah. We had a big screen. We, yeah. I mean, a regular screen. Like a big yeah, one. yeah. But right now, you know, devices is. is Unless even, you even in. You know, Even on the side, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, it's on the wrist. Side, they, they're so smart, they know how to hide mm -hmm. things. Yeah. You just have to be vigilant and, you know. And you have to just know things. what apps they have on their devices and you have to know what the settings are. Right. Right. It is a lot of work. It's not. <laughs> it's not that easy. It's definitely not that easy. Okay, so in part two, we'll then just we'll move into the what's called the so what, and you know you used to think that juggling diaper bags and babysitters and eating time and bath time and like that was it's a lot to juggle when you raise a child, but now look what we're juggling. You know now you're juggling everything around the media influence out there in the world, and it's not easy. So just to recognize this, not an easy brave new world that we have here. I just looked up, I went online just to see, looked up screen time for kids. You can't believe how many books there are. So I just took a screenshot of, you know, this is just a screenshot, there's like over 100 books out there. And so just, just as an idea in terms of for you is that you go, you go ahead and, and look at this in terms of the age of your, your child or your children and choose a book. Choose a book that you can read as, as spouses and you know, just say, okay, let's choose this and let's talk about this. You could also share with another, you know, it could be a relative or a friend and say, hey, you guys, you wanna share reading this book. And in education world, what we do is, you know, one of the ways if you say, oh my God, I don't have time to read this whole book. If there's three people reading it and it's, I'm making this up and there's six chapters, I'll read the first two, you read the next two, we call that jigsawing, divide and conquer. We don't have to read the whole book, you read the first two chapters, tell me the highlights. You read the next two, tell me the highlights. And, but it's a way for you to get another perspective. So that's just an idea. The other thing that, that zero to three said is that obviously it's not just the, the quantity, how much time your kid spends on the screen, but it's the quality. And it really does have an effect on their sleep, on their weight, on their attention span, so much around bedtime. Now, a lot of this stuff is things that 
we know. I mean, I, I mean, these are, are things that we just know in terms of you wouldn't ha sit in bed with a device with your child be right as they're going to sleep, you know. You really want to avoid that. So these are all things that are not necessarily new, but cumulatively they add up. So it's just reminding ourselves that for the, especially for the young kids, yeah, no, there should be nothing around bedtime. But for the older kids, when you look at the, the, the bullet towards the bottom, a lot of these apps have ads, and they pop up. And kids don't know what the heck these, especially the young kids, they don't know what the heck these are. So you have to talk about advertising. <laughs> they need to understand, because they just think, oh, that looks cool, I want that. Either if it's something to eat, you know, it could be some really unhealthy kind of snack that you would never want your kid to have, but now they want it because they saw it there. So for the older kids, for kids, you know, like between five and eight, it's really thinking about balance, you know. So thinking about your kid in relation to, are they sleeping, are they healthy, are, is there connections with friends, with family? So are they having those in-person kind of connections? Are they engaged in school? Are they having fun when they're actually using digital media? So these are, again, just thinking about the older kids more so than the, the younger kids. But these are just common sense things to think about for your child, but that sometimes we forget that, oops, oh yeah, I just noticed, he hasn't been sleeping well. You know, he's, you know, she's getting really picky about eating, never used to do that. So pay attention to those kinds of things. And now it goes back to us, what we, we kind of agreed on. What, what are our best practices? What are, as adults, what are our practices? And, and the, for the young kids, using it with your child, not for your child, but using it with your child. Get your expectations in order and then be really clear and consistent about what are your rules, what are your consequences. So make sure you know what you're, what you're saying and, and follow through with what you're saying. Always connect it to real life, to the 3D world. Talk about that advertising. For kids that, again, as the, you know, five and older, they can undo, you could talk to them about being a consumer. What's consumption? You know, it's a word that they probably don't know. But what is consumption? What's a consumer? And when you watch something, you know, you're just watching it, and wa you're consuming. You're consuming this media. What's the difference between that and creating? And you can, you know, talk to kids who does stuff, stuff with Legos. Wow, when you make something with the Legos, you are creating a masterpiece here. Here you're just consuming, you know, that. So it's, it's fine to begin that conversation with kids, especially over five years old. And then you could start to talk about digital citizenship as they get older. And the biggest thing, you're it, you know. That's, you're it as the adult. You are the model. So they are going to, they watch everything that, that adults say or do. So we, we think they may not be watching us, but they're watching us. So then there's the, the thing about cell phone safety. Now that's, you know, that's been out. There are so many different studies and conclusions and all coming from the scientific community about cell phone safety. And there's actually more in Europe than there is here. So I think Europe has been studying this for quite a while in terms of cell phone safety and sticking it in your pocket. That's why so many, actually texting turned out to be kind of a good thing relative to health because kids weren't like this. It wasn't right next to their head as opposed to, no, it's still in their hand. I mean, it's still, they still shove the thing in their pocket usually, but, you know, at least it's using it here versus here. But the one thing we know is that the radio frequency environment that we live in now, unmatched. We never had anything like this. So this is, this is very new and it's only becoming more <laughs> versus less. So we're looking at, you know, stepping into the 5G world and how that's going to affect radio frequency. This last bullet comes from the Academy of Pediatrics that basically, what it's basically saying is that if you think about a cell phone tower, you think about your cell phone and cell phone towers. So there's signals that are constantly being emitted back and forth. So the radiation that comes out of that is real. I mean, that it's, it's there. And for kids, that whose bodies and brains are still developing. Think about, especially the young kids, you know, they're still developing all of this. That is why 
the what they call energy deposition, meaning you know that what's being pinged back and forth is being so-called deposited. So just think about the exposure more so than deposition. So that exposure is twice as high in the brain, 10 times higher in the bone marrow because it's kids. And the other thing is that, think about these kids, again, they, they're born into this world. So those little babies you saw, and, you know, you know, playing with the cell phone, from that young an age, they are exposed to it. And that continues all their life into adult. We haven't even seen studies that go that quite that long yet over many, many decades. So that's one kind of safety. Then there's, has anybody ever heard this term, sharenting? Have you heard that term? I wondered if you might have. So this, this sharenting is actually, it's another safety consideration and it has to do with online privacy. So this is basically the term means I am sharing my child's identity online through social media. And I mean, that's like so common. And, and so common that 92% of toddlers under the age of two already have their own individual digital footprint. 92%, that's like almost every little child under the age of two. And, and I think about all little kids that I do know under two and how many photos I've seen of them. A lot, <laughs> a whole lot. So that is something that what you have to think about is you have to talk about vigilance. You really have to be vigilant about settings. And that's something, or where you upload too. So if you were gonna be uploading a picture of a young child and you're on an, an open Wi-Fi, you know, that can be breached. So it's looking, because pedophile sites really do steal from social media. That's the first place they go because it's very available, and I'm sure you, you know, yeah. you've studied that. I haven't heard the term sharenty, but um, this is something that I actually uh, have learned about and speak about. It's on Instagram, and, and pro, um, uh, explorers will use this now because a lot of young parents, what they do is they create this account in their child's name, and then they chronicle, there's this blueprint of their child as their child gets. And so you see, you know, at the birthday party, different events, and they begin to, uh, there's geotagging, and they're following you, and then they're seeing who your family members are, who your friends are, they can see everything, you can go on and see all these. It's interesting, and now you can reach out. Instagram's starting to change some of its, um, its settings, but not all of them yet. But anyway, that is a very common way of exploiting it. It is. Charenting. Yeah. Well, the, the term charenting is that as a parent, I'm sharing, sharing, I'm sharing, but I'm sharing my kids. Their whole identity is just plopped online, you know, from, from this very young age. So this little vi video clip comes from Children's Coalition, and it's a, a, another one minute, and it's kids' voices talking about their online privacy in relation to posting. When our parents post these pictures, they might think it's cute. But they never think about how they are overexposing us. Making us vulnerable to pedophiles and sex offenders. It's time for parents to think twice before they post. Kids for privacy. Let's take over all hashtags that overexpose kids by using signs that reclaim our right to privacy online. Create your privacy please sign and share your picture using one of the hashtags that overexpose kids on social media. Join the Kids for Privacy movement. All kids have the right to privacy online. Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> Very true, and uh, you know sometimes kids have wise advice, and that was that, that was one of them. So that and that so they're speaking directly to sharenting and what happens when you're continually uploading to social media and thinking that you know it's cute, but where can this end up? So that's a direct impact that that it can have, but then. Our use of smartphones 
has both direct and indirect impacts. And <laughs> you could see in this picture, you know, that, that, that kind of s speaks for itself. You know, that there's both an a indirect and a direct impact that you see there. It can really interfere with our ability to parent in a healthy manner. It definitely, that can, it definitely interferes with our, our ability to parent. For a lot of kids, they feel like they have to vie for attention. Young kids, not the older kids. They're very happy to see you, you know, then, then you won't bother them, then they could be on their phones. But for the younger kids, you know, I've seen little kids be like, Mom, Mom, you know, just really vying for that attention. So yeah, they, and sometimes they really do get angry or feel left out. When you look at their social emotional development, which is, you know, that's crucial for kids. I mean, from birth all the way <laughs> into adulthood, but they, that's gonna have an effect on their social emotional development. And it definitely has an effect, and you probably notice it yourself as a parent when it's not okay. So what zero to three has said is that, you know, you know that you have lots of things to do in your day. And we all multitask. Kids do it, but we do too. And sometimes we have to do it just to get through a day. I mean, you, there's just so many hours in a day and so much to do. But when it comes to kids, think about times that, you know, if I'm going to have my phone here and this is my computer over here and I'm, I'm either playing or talking to my kid over here, but, you know, I could see out of the corner of my eye, you know, something comes up on my computer. I could hear something if I have a note, if my phone's on and I've got notifications on. I, you know that, you know, I'm going to go from here to here, back to here, back to here. So essentially, what you know the, the suggestion is is that pick pick times where you don't have to do that. You know that's if if you feel like you have to do four things at once, then don't. That shouldn't be a time that you're with your child because going back to quality versus quantity. You know if you just say okay, I'm going to carve out four minutes, and it's just going to be with my child. That's way better than 44 minutes that are, are constantly like this, and your child doesn't feel like you're really there. So that's, that's one suggestion. Another one is to look at your lifestyle and say, okay, these are out all the time. Like you said, Mike, you know, walking down the hall and you feel like, you know, I'm just constantly pulling up. Well, that's different in terms of work, you know. Work is one thing. Let's put work aside in, in this equation. Work is work. Okay, that's fine. But when you leave work, you can leave work. And I always think back to, gosh, you know, the days before a cell phone, I wasn't reachable. <laughs> I mean, you just weren't reachable. Like if you were driving in your car and you were going from point A to point B, you wouldn't be able to communicate with somebody. So, but somehow now, you know, that, that's happening all the time. So choose, choose places. It could be in your house, outside of your house, times, times of day, you know, that we're, we're just not going to, as a family. So, it, it, I mean, you have to do it, too. <laughs> so you have to be really clear about this, you know. And you can do it with older kids, too. You know, make some agreements that, hey, let's just be able to sit down at dinner together and not have any device that shows up in a pocket, in a hand, on a table, within reach, period. You know, that's, that's a different lifestyle. And... You know, that, so you, you have to negotiate with older kids, for sure. But you can create it for younger kids. And then even the background, you know, if you have a TV going and you're having dinner, it's distracting. So, and kids, if they tune into, they might be tuning into what they're hearing over here. So it's trying to keep that time, kind of respecting that time together. And then for really young kids, it's, you know, you always have bath, bedtime eating. That's, that's kind of a routine with a young kid. So in those young years, then you definitely want to have that be that, you know, real person interaction called serve and return. But it's really about interacting together. So this is another um, short video clip from the NPR. The time that little kids spend with small screen. And I could tell I'm going to have to put this sound up. That's what I wanted to check. So NPR, NPR did this, this is about two minutes long, and 
It's a short video clip that says, hey, screens are in our lives. Oh, what do we do about it? You know, what do we do about it? What came out of the Common Sense Media report at the very beginning. But it's pretty logical, you know, enjoy screens, you know, not too much and as much as you can together. So Russ, I think about, you know, your seven and 10 year old, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna want screen time. So you have to be realistic about, well, how can we do this in a way that works as opposed to, to fighting what it is that they, they always want. So one of the things that, this is a slide that we use in our, when we do the bullying presentation, but what's in the center of that bullseye graphic is bullying. And I just switched it around and said, okay, in a child's use of any kind of a digital device, if that's the center, because that's what's happening in our kids' lives, is they always have this digital device. What are the influencing factors to that? And when you look on the far right side, and this is also in terms of this, what it was true in terms of bullying, you know, what, what were the influencing factors for children in relation to either being bullied or being a bully or getting bullied? The order and the impact changes as they get older. So obviously for you as a parent, for young children, huge amount of impact. When they start to get into those tween and teen years, yeah, well, that just kind of goes down the drain. You know, all of the impact comes from their friends and their peers. That's what's, and society, really our, our, our cultural norms in our society. Those are the three biggest influences as they get older. But, you know, between the age of zero and like eight, nine years old, you've got, you've got, you've got a fair amount of, of influence with them. So I always give the example of, you know, when you drop a, a stone in water and it creates those reverberating circles, to look at it like that, but in reverse. So instead of the child's use of a device or instead of bullying, creating those, it's all of those outer concentric rings that influence a child's use of a device. So, and honestly, I think our cultural norms and our society at large is huge because that's what's changed a lot. I mean, that's what, cha that's what changed so much when you looked at that, the mobile use that went from 4% to 35 over a six year period of time. It's because our society changed like that, our norms changed. So that's a big, that concentric circle has, has a whole lot of influence, but so do the peers and the friends. So when you look at the question at the top, what, who, who or what influences it? It's, it's not really, we as adults and parents can't always control the, the who and the what because it's coming from about 12 different directions and from a, many different ways. So it's not necessarily people, it could be places, it could be things, and you know, it could be locations where they are. So lots of that, but you we can be conscious and vigilant about the how. So how is media gonna influence my child? And for the very young child, how am I going to allow this to happen? What is my, you do, you have to look at your domains of control. And when your kids are young, you've got some of that domain of control. <laughs> As they get older, not so much. You start to lose that. So while you've got it, that's when you, you really want to create that foundation. So you're not going to count off by threes because you're already in the little group that you're going to be. And I'm not going to divide you here, but this is really, if it was a bigger group, I was going to divide by these three different topics so that, you know, we could, again, kind of divide and conquer, but we could just talk here in terms of what strategies have you used to manage screen time and how has that worked or not? And then what are your thoughts about the digital footprint for children? And what do you do with that? And what are your thoughts about it? And then what about your use of media in front of your child? So of those three different topics, those are, you know, I'd like to hear from, from you guys about each of those instead of grouping us, <laughs> grouping you, we'll just do this as a, a full group. Well, I think, you know, for the first one, you could, you could <coughs> have set limits, you know, timers, you know, you limit the time. So use timers, you know. Have you done that with your kids? Yeah. yeah. And to, how do they respond to that? Um, you have to follow up on it. 
it'll, it'll, go, it'll go beyond the time if you don't stop. Right. Right. Yeah, I feel like the hardest thing about setting rules, I and mean, when my kids were younger, the, the screens were much less capable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but I found that trying to manage and set rules, it was hard to, to you know, uh, to stay with it. Like, in other words, you, if you set the rules and you don't follow them, then they don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Right. So you got to follow it through, and yeah. it takes energy and time and commitment to follow it through. And, um, I mean, there were a couple, you know, I'm trying to, it feels like there was a couple times where, okay, you know, you've lost your phone privileges for a day. Yeah. And that was a battle. That was, that was you know, that was a, yeah. that was not easy on anyone. Yeah. You know, but, but uh, I feel like, you know, looking back on it now and knowing the power, you know, the, the incredible new power of the new screens today yeah. is, is, is trying to come to an agreement. Like rather than set rules, yeah. try to communicate, you know, and I guess, you know, to a five or eight year old, you could probably have a conversation about it, but it, like to negotiate a plan yeah, and say, hey, look, you know, we're, you know, we see the, you know, talk about the research and talk about, you know, we've learned this. And so after dinner until bedtime, we're, we're going to put our screens away, all of us, the whole family. Mm -hmm. How do you, you know, can, can we agree with that? Or, I don't know. Negotiate a deal. Right. Right. Yeah, and it, and it, consistency is the most important thing, right? But they would see if they see you doing it too, right? and that is the hard part, <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. So you have to be careful about what you set up, because you got to be darn sure that you're going to stick to it. You know that, otherwise it backfires. It definitely backfires. Yeah. I think when they're definitely when they're young, you have so much. Um, uh, I mean, you're, you know, they're looking to you to set the guidelines and, you know, you were the biggest influencer in their life, so it's easy at that point to actually, actually step in and do that. Now, as they get older and their, their friends become more important, uh, and the media and just the pressure in life, that becomes harder and harder. And I think it's more about, and it's so sophisticated now, but my kids, I think the main thing is we have the computer in the, in a, a common area, so I felt like there was some control off of that. And like you said, it takes an enormous amount of time. Like you have to be on it all the time. You really do. Yeah. And but um, we we would do things like take the phone away if I didn't see them being responsible in certain areas with it or something. And then they would lose that privilege for a while until they were more responsible. And I see that now with like these different apps. They're so sophisticated that if you, I'm learning. And in our training as well too, it's if you feel your child is not mature enough in certain areas, then why would you let them have Instagram or TikTok or all these other apps now that are just have these multi-platform usage, right? So it's such a balancing act, and act, and it's not so much um, trying to sneak up on them and find out. But I think, like you said, being you know interactive, there's no perfect storm. Yeah. Um, it's like the perfect storm. But anyway, it's being interactive. And it's learning about what apps they have on their phone, then go learn about it. Go learn about the settings, go learn about what they're doing, have a discussion, right. and then it shows you're interested. It's such a balancing act. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the interactive. And if you set things up so that you are continually in a dialogue with them about it, because if, if kids are just given, okay, well, here you go. You know, you don't put, don't do, you know, this is, you know, need to give it back to me in two hours. Whoo! <laughs> you know, they, they can just go wild with it. So the interactive, the checking in and the dialogue is essential. Yeah, and, the and the model, yeah. On the table, and so like dinner time, everyone had to put their phone in the basket. That's great. But That's great. We had to put our phone in the basket. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh my gosh, and then if I, you know, see a screen light up or something, I'm like, oh my gosh, is that, you know, your tendency is to. Yep. So I had to really get myself in check. You know? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we're just as addicted as the kids are. I mean, that in our own way, we are equally addicted. What about the digital footprint? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just, that one I see so much of. Um, with the online and media and gaming apps that I've been interacting with in training, 
and um, it's this profile aid, the sharing team that you refer to. But I see that with, with people, they do that with their, their pets as well. Yeah. But I see more of it now um, with predators looking at when it's family members, and when, especially when they have a child and they chronicle that child. Yeah. And so, and, and they're also using their hashtags as a way of finding out what they're passionate about as a way of exploiting them as well. Right. So hashtags are great, they don't get me wrong, they can be, I like them too. But they're being used in a multi, right. multi fashion. So yeah, right. I I totally think that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's my my nephew has instead of uploading to any social media, he created a family share um, album. Oh. So all the photos of his kids he uploads there. And I get to view the photos in our family. That's just our, our album, you know. That's not, it's not something that's uploaded to a social media site. Yeah. And that's a great idea. We do a family thread, message thread, just the family. And so we don't share those pictures online. Yeah. Right. And so we just share those. And so when, when things are going on every day with all of us within the family, that's where we share it. Right. Yeah. So there doesn't, but I like your idea, the album. Is it's just an album. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's one way of, of just cutting down on the, what would be an online footprint. And, because you do, I mean, uh, you, you want to send pictures. It, it, that's one of the great things about digital pictures and relatives and friends that live far and flung all around the world. You want to be able to share those, but you also want to be careful about what you're sharing. So I, th I think, you know, once digital photos became it, then you know you could take a hundred photos in a day, and not think twice about what you're posting. And what they're finding is these photos in like Instagram, Snapchat, and WhatsApp. Once they're uploaded, and like maybe it's a video or a picture, and it goes for like thirty seconds, and then kids will post this stuff, crazy stuff, because it goes away within thirty seconds, or they right. think it does. Yeah, it, it doesn't. Goes away. It's embedded in the app. Right. And so those pictures never go away. So let's just say they send something which is totally risque. It, it's there. Right. It's accessed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure that the kids quite fully understand that yeah. it's never gone. Yeah. <laughs> the point that we're trying to yeah. It's never gone. They yeah. also think it's yeah. I'm just doing this to my family, even at all. Yeah. It's just my family, it's just my friends, all yeah. it's private, and it's not. Once you put something in Facebook, they own it. You don't. Right. They own it. So how do you do the, uh, what is the album? The album is, so like in photos, on my, my iPhone in photos, you can go into albums and you could create a new one and you can invite people to that album. And so who's invited to that, it's in the cloud, and my nephew started this probably 12 years ago, and that's, and we've just had it for the longest time. And that's where, so he, of, his, his brother, who's younger, he does a lot on Instagram and the family album, where my other nephew, who's older, does nothing on social media and only uses the family album. So I think it, you know, it, it's, it's their generation. So some generations just continually lose <laughs> use social media. It's just something that they're always doing. So what are your ideas or thoughts about how you would think differently about your media use in front, and I don't care if your kids are 38 or they're seven or they're two, you know, what, what might you do different with your own kids in a social, you know, in a family situation with your, your digital use? Yeah, like, you know, so leaving here tonight, what might you think differently about doing tomorrow, next day, next day, what? Yeah, so, so for me, I, you know, I use social media not as a way to post, but to tr try to stay up with my kids. Like, yeah. in other words, I, you know, I, you know, just to see what they're doing, have another way of kind of communicating and understanding, but then, when I see a post that they do that's concerning to me, I just call and say, I would take that down. That, you know, that, that is not something, you, you know, it's out there now, but you, you don't want to have it out there. You know, I mean, just 
to communicate. I mean, I, I have had lots of conversations with my kids in their 21 and 25 about the, the digital footprint. And then, you, know, you might just do something that's funny or you think is funny, but when you're applying for a job in five years, that could pop up. You know, and, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's because yeah. they're it's a cavalier age, you know. Right. Um, but I, I, I guess I the best thing I can do is just to talk to my kids about my understanding of and concern about digital citizenship and, and your digital footprint. Mm -hmm. It will always be there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be careful. Yeah. And that's a good point because I think parents can be afraid of speaking up and saying something. And yeah. like I'll say those things to my kids. I'll be like, hey, this is what I found out. And it's because I love you I'm telling you this. Yeah. And I'll tell them. Right. And you know, take it for what it's worth, but I just want you to know. Right. And the, the easy call is not to say a word and the tough call is to speak up. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think not being afraid to, if there is a concern, that shows that you love them and you care about them or else you wouldn't say anything. Right. So I, and then, yeah, I'm just trying to think what else I would do differently. Or model, how might you model differently? Or use, uh, the use of your phone, what might you do differently in terms of the use of your phone? <laughs> yeah. I think probably less, less, less use of it in the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, and you have to be really conscious of that. I don't even have kids in the house, and I feel like I have to be conscious of that. You know, just the, the fact that, okay, I do not need to, you know, it's 8 o'clock at night. I'm turning this thing off. I do not need to see, know, you know, if there's, I don't think there's going to be any real emergency in the next four hours. That, you know, there's a landline here. You know, there's, somebody could drive up, but. Yeah, that's a good point. I need to do that. I need to sort of, like, you know, Eight o'clock. I don't need to keep checking my email to see what's coming in or what I need to do. Like really, seriously, I just need to like put it down. Right. 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 I don't right. Know I'm doing that. Yes. So, and, I and it's good stuff, but you know what? That's it. That's I'm making excuses for it. Yeah. 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 Yep. I mean, just like it's not good for kids at bedtime, it's not good for us either. <laughs> there is a, there's a matter, there's the, that blue light is not good for any human being. It's really bad for, for little kids, but for any human being to have that before you are trying to get, you know, you're getting in those hours before sleep. It's one of the reasons why America doesn't sleep well is it, it's, you know, we're constantly looking at screens and into the, into the nighttime. Okay, so you're not going to be doing that. Recap of part one, so part, before we go into part three, part one really was the what, that was the two studies from common sense and from zero to three. And basically, you know, again, this isn't rocket science here, real world learning, you know, don't, don't look at those educational apps or look at those, you know, movies as thinking the best thing for the kids. Balance, you know, make sure it's balanced and they get that real and real world learning so they can have that transfer of learning because otherwise they're, they're going to have that little deficit. And then the so what, the part two was navigating. So, what are the best practices for my child, for me, for their privacy? How do I avoid those multitasking pit pitfalls that I fall into? And then, how am I going to be the model? And then we had looked at the bullseye. So part three, that this is really about resources. And I'm going to get back up here because I'm going to actually click on these. So I want to actually show you some of these websites. So Common Sense Media is the one that why am I not looking? Oh, here's their list. So you can see they have movies, TV shows, parents need to know. The par they, they have, they have a, a heck of a lot, so let's just look into parents need to know. You can be looking at this by age, which is really helpful, because sometimes you read stuff and you think, oh gosh, this is like really written for a 15-year-old and I've, I've got a six-year-old. So you could look by age, by topic, so now you could look at cell phones, social media, screen time, violence in the media, privacy and online. So you get to, you get to see, see how you can navigate this. But movies and TV shows, 
you're thinking about taking your kid to a movie. You go, okay, well, what's, what's in the theaters now? Oop, okay, so Common Sense will review all of this. And they will have TV lists, they will, and YouTube. Oh my God, that's like, you could, we could just have an evening talking about YouTube. I mean, YouTube, there's some pretty bad stuff that prop, pops up on YouTube. And sometimes you think you're in a good YouTube and your kids are watching a good YouTube. <laughs> and so, oops, you know, so it took a couple left-hand turns and it's not so good now. So there's some reviews about the YouTube channels, but you can see they have a lot. And I just really encourage you to use them as one of your resources because they really do have books, apps, and games. You know, that's actually another really helpful thing. So best app list and getting app reviews, game reviews. So you've got kids playing games. This will give you some ideas. So that's Common Sense Media. And then we've got zero to three. And zero to three, Basically, the way, where you would look under here for zero to three would be explore our topics, because then again, it will go by ages and stages. And they have a, some really interesting things on, on brain development too. So again, remember, this is, this is the younger, younger years. But you know, they break it down in terms of parenting, and so you're gonna be interested more in the parenting, the early learning, and well-being. Those are the areas that you would be looking at. And then, common sense media, family media toolkit. So back into common sense, and I gave you the link for this, but this is really, and this actually comes, this is in partnership with the Academy of Pediatrics, so common sense work with them. And it's age-based guidelines for media and device use. And we had this conversation earlier, Mike and, and I were talking about, well, when do you get a kid a cell phone? You know, like what, what age? And I think Kimberly was in the room earlier and we were talking to her too, that it isn't an, it's not necessarily an age. I remember going back to the three C's from zero to three saying, it's your individual child. And it's really, so in some cases it's circumstances and it is the maturity and so you, you can't say that, okay, when my kid's 12, they're gonna get a cell phone. You know, not necessarily. Look at this, maybe they don't need a cell phone when they're 12. You know, I've, I have a niece who is divorced and she's got two young kids and one of them's 12 and they needed a cell phone for communication. So, but she was really very specific about how that was gonna be used. Those circumstances warranted it in a different way that some kid whose mom's gonna pick them up from school every day, yeah, not necessarily need that cell phone. So that's, that's something that you'll be able to see here in terms of the resources, age-based media use. So here's some advice in terms of that. And then media use from zero to two, so for the very young, and then tips and advice. So they have, a, a lot of times these are just like little posts and um, articles, but be that role model, you know, there's the, go back to the role model. And then another resource is PBS Kids for Parents. So PBS for Kids has a lot of great stuff. So if you were to look at shows, and you're gonna see some specific shows, some of which if you don't have little kids, you'd say, huh, I wonder what these are. Peg and cat, gee. <laughs> so that, but you'll, uh, you'll be able to see what they are. And then learn and grow. This is by age. So if you've got a seven-year-old and you click on seven-year-old, you'll be able to see topics about emotions and self-awareness. One of the things that comes out in terms of the research and social and emotional learning is as if kids can actually not only understand emotions but be able to verbalize them in a way that they can, they can describe those emotions. That helps in a huge way their maturity in the social emotional domain. So this would just give you some ideas for a seven year old relative to social skills, emotions, and then in actual educational realms, literacy, math, science. So that's another one. And then this is 
actually not, I'm not gonna click on a website here, but this came out of zero to three. And you know how we all use, whether it's FaceTime or Skype, you know, video chats are, are very common. And they're very helpful. I mean, gosh, think about how many times you've been able to communicate with kids far and wide that you wouldn't be able to do anyway. So that's the big plus of it. And or if one of you is out of town and you know, the, the child could be able to communicate with you. But what happens, especially with really young kids, is they're really excited and they're looking at the screen and they're bored within about 30 seconds because it's, it's over. They, oh, I see you, hi, 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 hi. And now they, the adults are wanting to converse and the kid is bored. You know, they, they really, they're, they're done with it. So an idea for the very young kids is make it interactive. You know, don't just talk. They have that, that you could be dancing together, you could be singing together, you could do finger plays together. You know, the, you actually using props. So it could be a book that you both have a copy of and you're taking turns reading from that book. Or you are, for very young kids, you might each have a car in your hand and you're talking about where your car is going and where their car is going. It's a way to really remember about those, those four C's of engagement and activity, social. That is a way to really engage kids in these, in what we do with video chats. And then we all are, are kissing the kids on the screen, you know, kiss, kiss, or we're tickling them, or so whoever is with them can actually be the hands and the heart. Give them a hug, give them a kiss, you know, tickle them there. Kids love pushing buttons, so for the young kids, they could start and stop. FaceTime or Skype, and then there's always technical difficulties. My gosh, it's, it's you know, kind of rare when you get through either a FaceTime or Skype without something kind of going a little snafu. So explaining that in very simple terms, but then you have all your props already, so they could be playing with those. So anyway, that's just some great suggestions from zero to three about video chats. Now, Bully is actually working with Scholastic Education to do what they're calling these, uh, it's power zero skills. And when you see that color wheel there, 12 powers for good, it really represents those social emotional skills that all kids need foundationally for their growth and their learning as children into adulthood. And you know, when you look at each of those, you can see that they're all rooted in either a social and emotional domain. So No Bully is just in the early stages of working with Scholastic right now on this, but that's also one of your resources that's listed there. So your next steps is, don't forget the three C's. You know, that's, I'm gonna get back down here. I don't need to use the screen now. So remember those three C's for your child and no matter what their age is, and that is, your individual child, what is the content, and what is the context. But think about those four pillars. So when you're thinking about content, think about is it engaging? Is it meaningful? Is it, is it their world? Does it have any social aspect to it? And are they actively involved? So how much is passive, how much is active? So that's another thing to think about. Think about your use, you know, limiting media time, ensure, oh no, for the young kids, limiting media time and get them out there, like dig in the dirt. Think about their digital footprint and the privacy. This is, becomes to your use. Be that, be that model, set those tech-free zones and times. Do it for yourself as much as you'd be doing it for your kids. And I think that we don't do this often enough. Our phones are literally tied to our bodies in a whole lot of ways, both literally and figuratively. And the more we can disconnect, the more we're present with each other and for our kids. And then use your resources that are in there in terms of everything I just gave you on that resource page. This little, I, I love this, this image. You know, this is, this is such a great image. And our kids are great imitators. Gosh, you know, kids really do know how to imitate. But be sure you're showing them how you want them to be. So that goes back to the role model, is we are the role model, and you just have to keep thinking about that. And as, as you said, it's a lot of work, but we need to be that role model. So thank you. I know that you know digital world is not easy. You just have to take it one step at a time, and 
we could do it. We can move on. Yes. Yeah.